This is Bishop John with a homily from Friar Doc for the 31st Sunday in Ordinary Time, uh, which would be the 24th Sunday after Pentecost this year. Uh, the Old Testament reading is taken from chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, uh, verses 2 through 6. <clears throat> the so the uh, responsorial four verses are from Psalm 18, verses 2 and 3, the latter part of 3 and 4 and then 47 and 51. And the uh, epistle reading is from the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter seven, verses 23 through 28. And finally, we're still in Mark. The gospel reading is from Mark 12, uh, verses uh, 28 through 34. And as always, I commend them to you highly. The readings this morning present us with the eternal fact of the great commandment and its overwhelming importance in the lives of those who seek true prosperity, fulfillment, and joy. What is presented in the readings today isn't just opinion, it is fact, divine law, and probably the most factual thing in our lives. Jesus, uh, as our great and immortal high priest, didn't change any of this, but rather fulfilled it. How are we doing with this great commandment and our relationship with our Messiah, do you suppose? What are we doing with it, regardless of whether, of whatever it is we, we say about it's important to us, importance to us? Does my life reflect my relationship with God? as being at the top of my list, so to speak, but at number four or five on the list of what I actually hold to be most dear, of what I actually spend my time, most of my time uh, thinking about or doing. If he is most important to me, my relationship with him infuses everything else in my life. If it's not, he's not. This is where I have to fish or cut bait. But I need to be clear about this. My tent, technically speaking, has no place in it where God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit shouldn't be. Is this what has happened to, with me? I, who claim to be a follower of the way? Am I truly participating or not? In the five verses from chapter 6 of the book of Deuter Deuteronomy, <clears throat> the Israelites are urged by Yahweh to keep all the commandments they have received from him through Moses. Most importantly, they are not to submit to the rules in blind obedience, but to embrace them, and therefore God himself, with great love and devotion. Moses uh, tells the Israelites to fear Yahweh your God and keep throughout the days of your lives all his statutes and commandments so they, so they may have long life. That's verse 2. He repeats the admonition saying, Hear then, Israel, and be careful to observe them, that you may grow and prosper the more in, uh, in keeping with the promise of Yahweh, to give you a land overflowing with milk and honey. Verse 3. Next comes the Shema, Shema the famous proclamation by the monotheist Israelites that there is one God only, and they are his people. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. Verse 4. The greatest of the commandments, as Jesus told us, uh, told us all follows you shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength verse 5 finally Moses urges his beloved Israelites once again to 
take to heart all that he has told them. Verse 6. In these few verses, the Israelites and all of us are called to a relationship with God that is intense, personal, and visceral. We are to observe his commandments and not to forget or ignore them. We can't do this by checking off boxes and proclaiming that God is now on our side. Our relationship with him has to be one of intense love, love that envelops all of what we are, body, mind, and soul, and all of our strength. This kind of love cannot help but change how we view the world and others around us, and how we act in it and with them. Whether, uh, whether or not the ma uh, material conditions of our lives change much, it is our focus on our Abba that changes our perspective on the world and that fills our lives with certainty, peace, and joy. Whether quiet or otherwise, whether on key or not, our own songs of praise should simply bubble up from overflowing hearts or we haven't taken this stuff, all this that God offers us, seriously. Jesus didn't change the law. As he said, he came to fulfill it, Matthew 5:17. He explained it in simple terms for simple folk. That would be yours truly. And he demonstrated it. He walked the talk, as it were, and all the way to the cross on Golgotha. Jesus Christ offers us redemption, but he doesn't stop there. He also shows us how to accept the priceless gift and how to live redeemed lives. In the verses from Psalm 18 for today, King David tells God in many ways uh, how he knows he supports him. He loves God and praises him. God is his strength and he loves him. Verse 2. He says, Yahweh is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock of refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Verse 3. Grabbing hold of the horns of the altar is supposed to guarantee protection, by the way. He praises Yahweh and exclaims, claims, I am safe from my enemies. Verse 4. Exhibiting his profound faith, he blesses God as his rock and extols him as his savior. Verse 47. Reigning very successfully as the king of David of uh, Israel, David knows God gave great victories to him and showed kindness to him as his anointed one as well. Verse 51. The verses here form a praise song, a doxology, a doxologia uh, in Greek, at the beginning and end of the, of the psalm, which is the longest of the psalms attributed to King David. They are an example of what we, uh, we see often in the Old Testament and here at every Mass. They are also sprinkled throughout Jewish and Christian prayers, meditations, and, uh, and devotions. So we can see they have been a part of the worship of the faithful for thousands of years. They are not to be uh, recited blindly and without feeling, but should spring rather from an overflowing fountain of love and reverence in us for the magnificence, magnificence majesty, and especially the redeeming love of our Abba, that is, our divine Papa. This psalm is one David sang to Yahweh after he was finally rescued by God from King Saul and his many uh, murderous minions, if you'll pardon the alliteration. We're told all this in verse 1 at the beginning of the psalm. The date was 1019 BC or thereabouts, a little over five centuries after the reading from Deuteronomy was written. The whole psalm appears uh, essentially unchanged in Second Samuel chapter 22, which is an account that places the reign of King David in its uh, uh, historical context. 
the blending of history with prayer and praise is very uh, tight in this case. It contributes as such to the argument that all of Scripture, divided, despite its remarkable diversity, is in fact a unified whole when properly uh, explicated and understood. David was enormously successful, militarily and otherwise, but it wasn't all smooth sailing or uh, much of a straight road, you know. The point made here in this psalm and in these verses is that even in his victories and triumphs, King David recognizes it has all come about because of Yahweh. As you might imagine, succeeding Davidic kings and, his, and this psalm use this psalm to celebrate their own victories over other kingdoms down through the centuries, but not usually with the same faith and devotion uh, to Yahweh. The Almighty is the basis for everything of importance in King David's life. His faith and trust in God are so deep as to be almost visceral. He knows this isn't because he's been a good boy all his life. He knows he's committed really egregious sins, but he also knows he has been uh, forgiven by God. When, uh, when, by the way, he has repented and turned to him in true sorrow and contrition. Despite his screw-ups, he knows God has rewarded his faith and trust with divine loving kindness, and his screw-ups he knows uh, uh, and, and uh, divine loving faith and, and protection for him. For him, Yahweh's commitment to his well-being has been pro provably, demonstrably never failing. He trusts completely that with God all things are possible, as our Messiah would remind us upwards of a thousand years later, Matthew 19.26. As the faith, uh, faithful king of a faithful nation, a faithful people, he represents the whole kingdom of Israel here. David knows that God will guide him with his voice and help him with his divine uh, intervention. In the six verses from chapter 7 of the Epistle to the Hebrews, we see further discussion of how the many priests were necessary, as well as their continued sacrifices for themselves and for the people. We also see why Jesus Christ was so much more than they. The writer of the epistle to the Hebrews tells the congregations that the reason there were many Levitical priests is because each one in his turn grew old and died. Verse 23. Jesus, however, remains forever, and so his priesthood is one that does not pass away. Verse 24. This means he is always able to save those who approach God through him, and he lives forever to make intercession for them. Verse 25. There is no need for him to offer sacrifice day for after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, because he did that once for all when he offered himself. Verse 27. It is therefore appropriate, he writes, that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, higher than the heavens. Verse, verse uh, 26. The law first appointed men subject to weakness to be high priests, but God's oath to redeem us that followed it appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. That's verse 28. And it references at least Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4, and 1 Samuel uh, 2, uh, verse 35. In general, the epistle to the Hebrews spends most of the time juxtaposing the old law with the new one. And these verses are no different. Jesus has fulfilled the law once for all in his sacrifice of himself. Verse 27 again. A sacrifice that makes him a high priest for us who is who 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 inter, uh, who is um, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, higher than the heavens? He says in verse twenty-six again. He intercedes for us 
for all time. There is no more sacrifice need, needed or even possible. As our high priest and king, he intercedes and advocates for us, but he hasn't changed the law. He has taught us in no uncertain terms that God the Father offers all who believe in his Son, Jesus Christ, forgiveness and redemption. He has been the pattern for us as well. He has shown us how to understand the law and how to have eternal life. It is a mission we should choose to accept. To borrow an old line from the 6673 Mission Impossible television series, as my friend Alan would remark, I'm just saying, as I've mentioned before about this book, uh, notions regarding its authorship uh, have changed over the centuries. Significantly, the Epistle to the Hebrews was attributed to Paul by Clement of Alexandria in the second century, written, he thought, in Hebrew and and then translated into Greek, probably by Luke. Many of, of his contemporaries, however, were already questioning the attribution, and problems with it continued uh, to mount. Today, the, court, uh, the consensus of scholars suggests it is probably not Paul's work. It is the only book in the New Testament written not in Koine or common Greek, but in classical Greek the kind taught in the Jewish schools of Alexandria and not in Palestine. This would suggest that Paul, or Luke translating for Paul, would not be a particularly good choice for authorship. Apollos, whom Luke uh, considered as uh, an eloquent man in Acts 18.24, and whom Paul recognized as a very effective disciple among the Gentiles, 1 Corinthians uh, 3.4, uh, almost certainly was educated in the schools of Alexandria. This makes him, therefore, a primary candidate for the author's job here. Although it was widely accepted as scripture by the beginning of the second century and is part of the canon, we still don't, uh, we still don't really know who, for sure who, who wrote the epistle, or wrote it down at least. In any case, it was accepted early on for its voice and its content regardless of its authorship. That it was attributed to Paul, to Paul didn't engender its inclusion in the canon, but rather reinforced it. In the reading from chapter 12 of the Gospel of Mark, our Lord names and, conf and confirms the most essential elements of the law uh, to his questioner. When described came to Jesus and asked him which was the first of all the commandments, verse 28. Our Lord responded with, The Lord our God is Lord alone, verse 29. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, verse 30. Jesus added a second one as well, saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself, that's verse 31, and indicating there were no others as great. Uh, all this the scribe uh, re repeated and acknowledged as correct, verse 32 and 30, verses 32 and 33. The scribe was apparently more inquisitive uh, than antagonistic because our Lord commended his understanding. You are not far from the kingdom of God, 34. If some had doubts about Jesus' competence as a teacher, the exchange erased them, and no one dared to ask him any more questions. Verse 34 again. The words our Lord quoted from Deuteronomy 6.5 are part of the Shema Yisrael, the prayer all faithful Jews have said each morning and evening for thousands of years, ever since Moses gave it to them, actually. They follow immediately from, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, Deuteronomy 6.4. And there was nothing in it with which the Pharisees could disagree or use uh, to trip up Jesus. The same can be said for the verse he took from the book of Leviticus. The whole verse was another very clear piece of the law. It wasn't a recommendation, it was a commandment. 
Do not seek revenge or hear a grudge or bear a grudge against any of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh, Leviticus 19.18. That is, this is the word, not of Moses, but of the Lord. Once again, it should be clear that our Lord wasn't mistaken when he said he didn't uh, invent anything. He didn't come to change the law, but to fulfill it, Matthew 5.17. It had all been in the Torah since the time of Moses. There is something we should remember here, however, as we know from the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, uh, verses 29 through 37, Jesus did in fact extend the meaning of the word neighbor far beyond the comfortable Jewish boundaries they'd all been raised to think were adequate. <clears throat> the same encounter here in the reading for today, by the way, appears in Luke 10, verses 27-28 and Matthew 22, verses 37-39. So its importance in the early church should be clear. Our Lord isn't just <coughs> outsmarting scribes or other adversaries here. <coughs> He's succinctly stating the essence of his whole teaching to one who respects him and has asked for it. The lesson today reminds us that our Lord, as he told us, didn't come to change the law, but to fulfill it. Matthew 5.17 again. Our focus needed correction, so he repeated the great Shema in Deuteronomy 6.4, proclaiming to all Israel of the oneness of God, and the two great commandments were first given to us through Moses in Deuteronomy 6.5 and in Leviticus 19.18. 18. <coughs> we don't have fallible high priests anymore, repeatedly uh, making sacrifices for us and for themselves, but rather the Son of God himself is our high priest, as the author of the Epistle to the Hebrews reminds us in the verses we read, read for today. He came down <coughs> from heaven and as a true man, except for sin, walked among us to teach us and to redeem us. His sacrifice once and for all has created the bridge the way with a capital W, by which we may seek forgiveness and, with the help of the Holy Spirit, by which we may enter into the pure white light of the court of the High King of Heaven, and even on into the arm, the loving arms of our Abba. Once again, the law, the Torah, hasn't changed. But when Jesus fulfilled it, the entire world changed. The light of Christ had been given to us, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter so essential to our journeys every day, was loosed in the world for our healing and guidance. Our understanding of the law was changed by our Lord, and the new wisdom has been in our possession ever, possession ever since. Our relationship with God, our orientation to other people and the world around us, and our understanding of our own purpose as we interact with it all necessarily have to change accordingly. All these centuries later, we walk through the world bathed in the light of the risen Christ. With our eyes and our hearts open, it should reflect out from us onto our brothers and sisters. It should blaze out from us and give his light to the world, a light to enlighten the nations. Luke 2.32. The, uh, the view, frankly, is magnificent for those with eyes to see. See, don't you know? God bless you and yours. <laughs>